Thank you everyone for your attendance today. We will be discussing our Masters of Applied Science in Spatial Analysis for Public Health and our Certificate um, in Spatial Analysis as well. Joining us today will be Dr. Carriero, Director of the Spatial Analysis, Tim Shields, um, uh, and Tim Shields, our Associate Scientist, and myself, um, Amory Arias. I am an Admissions Officer for the Online Programs of Applied Learning. I work here with our team to assist students as they're exploring their options and continuing education. I'm excited to be presenting with you all today. Um, Dr. Carriero, um, could you please start off and introduce yourself and then Tim Shields? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Frank Carriero, and I am a professor here at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. I've been working in the area of spatial analysis for over the last uh, 20 plus years, and uh, I am the program director for this online program, and I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about that program today. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Shield. I've been working here at the School of Public Health doing GIS for public health applications. Well, thank you both for your introduction. For about those same 20 some years as Frank. It sounds like we're having some technical difficulties. Um, could you please repeat yourself, please, Tim? Sure, sorry about that. Uh, does that sound okay now, Mary, or? I can hear you, Before go I ahead. Before I continue on? Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, so I'm Tim, I am Tim Shields, um, associate scientist here at the epidemiology department. And uh, I was saying, similar to Frank, I've been for 20 years or so, probably the same 20 years or so he has doing, a, and. Uh, it was fun putting this program together with Frank, and I look forward to sharing more about it this afternoon. Well, thank you both for your introduction. I apologize for the little technical difficulties, but to give everyone an idea of what we'll be covering today, um, Frank will take us over the industry overview. He'll go over the program details and curriculum, looking specifically into the curriculum, what you'll be gaining out of the program and the specific courses. Um, this program is fully online, so he'll give you an insight what it looks like to be in online learning here at Johns Hopkins University. We do have two uh, programs, the, mas uh, the master's and the certificate. Faculty will be highlighted. I will go into um, the admissions requirements, tuition and financial aid, details about the scholarship we offer, and then we'll save some time at the end. Um, for a Q&A. So if you have any questions while you're listening to the presentation, um, please feel free to type them into the chat box and we will cover those at the end with Tim and Frank. Um, thank you so much for your time and Frank, please feel free to start. Great, thank you. So let's start off simply with what is spatial analysis and it, it can really depend on, on who you ask and, and the definitions can, can certainly vary. Some of the key points that um, a lot of those answers would include, it's the interpretation of geographic information through the use of mapping software and statistical analysis. It builds on the foundations in both epidemiology and biostatistics, and spatial analysis is really one of these interdisciplinary fields, and, and, and I hope you get the feel of that a little bit as we go through this uh, presentation on, on spatial analysis. For us here at Hopkins, um, we take a very comprehensive view of spatial analysis and we call it our spatial science paradigm and it includes components of spatial data, geographic information system, and spatial statistics. And spatial statistics is just this subfield of statistics that is devoted through developing and applying tools for spatial data. You know, anytime you give a presentation on, on spatial analysis, um, a lot of times it starts with this famous John Snow map of, of cholera back in, in 1854 um, in London, England. And um, back at that time, cholera was actually thought to be an airborne um, disease. And what John Snow did, and he is was an epidemiologist at that time, was he, he was decided to map um, deaths due to cholera 
in in the London area there, and that's the map you see here on the slide. And he actually was seeing that these these cholera um, outbreaks were clustering around a water pump where people would go and get their cooking and and, and drinking water. And um, this really established this whole field of spatial analysis and actually turned um, provided evidence so that cholera was that which is known now as a waterborne disease rather than an, an airborne disease. And this is probably one of the first most famous applications of spatial analysis, simply mapping public health outcomes, in this case, you know, um, cholera, and um, and seeing how much, what evidence that shows in terms of how location be such a, a strong determinant of health. But now we fast forward a, a century and a half, and this is an example of what we can do now with the, the, the tools and the advances in spatial analysis. What we're showing here, you here is a, a map, a risk map of malaria. Um, so Tim and I, we work on malaria here at the school, and what you see here, the, the two maps, the, the red and pink maps are risk maps for malaria, both in what they call the dry and the rainy season in Zambia, which is in Southern Africa. And um, so this was based on data that um, community health workers would go to different houses and test people for malaria in the area. And based on those results, we're able to predict risk and map risk at areas where they haven't sampled them. We developed these these risk maps, which you see on the left-hand side. And then the corresponding shaded green maps are maps of prediction uncertainty. So not only do you get a map of predicted value, but you get a map of, of predicted uncertainty. And this is an example of how far we'd come from, from the, the simple John Snow mapping and uh, a lot of the advances in the tools that we can learn that you will learn in the program to be able to reproduce analyses like this. You know, the idea of, of using location information, you know, it's really kind of exploded over the last decade or so. Everybody now is is not only seeing the use and hearing about the use of location-based information, but they're they're using themselves. You know, all our everything on our phone now is tagged to our location, and we can easily search what is around me, what is near me, and um, everybody is now using um, um, GPS devices to help navigate and and so forth. So that idea of of spatial information, the availability, accessibility. Um, to that is, is has grown so much over the last um, decade plus, and uh, even in the media, you know, we always see maps now, and, and maps are are such a great way to convey information to to the general public. And here are just some examples of, of maps being used in in the media. We've had the the CDC loop. Um, weekly flu maps, which we'll probably start seeing again here pretty soon, um, just showing you, you know, how the how the flu epidemic is starting, how it's reaching its climax, and how it's it's dissipating and so forth on a weekly basis. Um, the bottom map was a really interesting one. We took this from the New York Times back in uh, 2017. This was more about our commercial footprint in terms of the stuff that we buy. How does that relate to endangered species and, and, and affecting negatively affecting the habitat of, of certain in, endangered species. So there's a lot of different applications and, and obviously we don't have time today to go through all the neat applications of, of spatial analysis, but um, we definitely cover a lot of these uh, applications in, in our program. You know, another example here is just looking at not only how things vary across space, i.e. geography, but how things vary both in space and time. So here's just an example of showing you trends in, in U.S. obesity between 2011 and 2015. So having a map at 2011, at midpoint at 2013, and one again at, at 2015. So it, it's, it's both space and time that um, really become interesting when using this type of location-based information. You know, why spatial analysis? Well, you know, before we get to any of the points that are on the slide there, it, it's it's an extra piece of information that that we're finding is is extremely powerful and valuable when doing public health research. I mean, according to the uh, US Labor Department, you know, the use of geospatial technology are so widespread and diverse. You know, the market is growing, they say, reported at a rate of almost 
35%. And just to grab this quote from uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's increasing demand for readily available, consistent, accurate, complete, and current geographic information and the widespread availability and use of advanced technologies offer tremendous and great job opportunities for people within many different talents and educational backgrounds. I mean, this idea of spatial analysis, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's a field itself, but it links so well with so many other different fields. Okay, it's almost like having an added niche or an added benefit to your, um, to your portfolio. In terms of public health specifically, you know, because spatial analysis can be applied outside the public health arena um, as well. But there was a great article out there that that actually had this this coined term about what gets measured gets done. And what that is speaking to is that when data is available, when something is measured and, and there's data available for that phenomenon, whatever it might be, that's what people use because because they can get it and they, and they can measure it. it's been measured and they can work with it and um, just to grab a quote from from this article is that leaders recognize that there is an urgent need for more timely and more geographically specific data at the neighborhood or what we call census tract level to efficiently and effectively address the most pressing public health problems that we're facing today. You know, and just to give you a little history about our program here in spatial analysis. So we started this about three or four years ago, and we were the first program that Johns Hopkins was putting out as uh, as this online master's and certificate um, program. So the first one was in spatial analysis. And the reason was that because a lot of the, uh, the deans and the other leaders here at the school went to different health agencies, CDC, public health departments, and so forth, and kind of surveyed them. So what is it that that is lacking in terms of education of your employees and skills of your employees? And, and what we were told is that by and large, everybody was saying spatial analysis. They, they need they need employees with skills and, and understanding in, in spatial analysis and not just the GIS mapping, but also this idea of analyzing and interpreting the maps with spatial statistics. So that leads re well into, you know, what are the potential careers in spatial analysis? So, you know, these career paths could both be narrowly focused and more encompassing. Um, you know, in terms of spatial analysis of public health, it it, it links to public health as as any other traditional public health career, you know. But like I said before, it's it could be like an added benefit or or a expertise or a niche that you have in terms of you could be an epidemiologist or a biostatistician. But you add to that the idea that oh, I know and I know spatial analysis as well, you know, whether it's GIS and or spatial statistics. Different job titles might include an environmental health officer, a GIS software developer a cartographer, a visualization specialist, a geographic information scientist, geospatial data administrator, spatial statistician. These are just a collection of, um, of potential job titles that, that people can pursue and have pursued as graduates of our program. And that reminds me of something that Tim and I were talking before um, before providing this this presentation is that you know a lot of our students that you know we've got three years in now and and these graduates now are are getting jobs and and competing for jobs and they're coming back and asking us for recommendations which we're you know we're happy to provide and they are these different jobs that they're going for are along the spectrum of of what you see there on the screen so there are a lot of possibilities out there for 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 graduates from our program. So let me give you some details about about the program. So we have both a master's and a grad and a certificate program. So the master's of applied science in spatial analysis for public health is 50 and a half term credits. Okay, and Hopkins works on um, terms. So we have four terms per year rather than the the, the usual um, two semesters per year per year. And and so. The program deals, we have courses, you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the curriculum and, and the courses in particular, but they're also professional development, like writing courses and, and so forth. And there's also this course on integrative activity, which I'm going to spend a few minutes on in, in the next slide or two. Um, but we also have a certificate program. So a lot of students 
that come to this program, they may say, hey, I already have the, the biostatistics and the epidemiology, epidemiological background already, whether they have an MPH program that they went through already or some other master's program, or they just had a really enhanced public health undergraduate degree, and they're really just interested in the spatial classes that, that we offer. And so for that, we can offer a, an 18 credit certificate in spatial analysis for, for public health. And that's just goes in four terms or, or one academic year. Um, our program overall, whether it's the master's or the certificate program, is skill-based, okay? So it, it's for the working professionals. So it's kind of a little different than what we might teach here on site to, to the students here um, that are more maybe research-based. Um, it's the program is 100% online and, and part-time, um, and the, our learning process here it's 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 more than just or I said it's it's different than just oh here's a textbook let's go through the chapters and and let's do the exercises at the end of the chapters it's very much a group learning interactive environment um, peer assessment we use that a lot it's all about building skills okay and and we go through a lot of projects examples hands-on learning i mean the courses that tim and i teach in in, in in all the spatial courses which i'll i think comes up on the next slide i mean we have no required books for those okay yeah we'll, we'll give some books as as references and resources you know but a lot of our lecture notes and the problems that you work on are problems that we've worked on here um, at hopkins through the past 20 or so years that we've been in this field um, the program focus is both local and global issues, you know, and the goal here is to prepare students to address public health problems through this multidisciplinary approach because that's really what what spatial analysis is. It, it's, you know, it brings in epidemiology, biostatistics, geography, and whatever the substantive field you're you're an expert at, you know, whether it's HIV, whether it's malaria or any other the the numerous other public health um subfields and 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 exposures out there and we're looking to apply the the latest scientific knowledge in terms of preparing students um for the for the for the world after after spatial analysis so here's the curriculum and and um this is available on site and 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 elsewhere in the flyers that we have i'm not going to go through these every every course every term here but you can see year one and year two you know one two three four the different terms that the year is split into and I just want to highlight so this is the um, this is a two-year master's program and I think the um, the courses that are asterisks are the ones that involve the um, the one-year um, certificate in, in spatial analysis um, we have four primary spatial classes here that that we teach and you get two of those classes in year one spatial analysis for public health in term one and spatial data technologies for mapping in term two um, then in year two um, you'll see in terms three and four down there at the bottom we introduce applied spatial statistics and and spatial applications and those four courses they run you through what what i referenced before that spatial science paradigm spatial data GIS and spatial statistics. So those are the four core courses in spatial analysis. We have two labs um, um, throughout the throughout the two years, one in year one and one in year two. And that's for terms when you're not taking one of these core spatial classes. We have sort of a two credit lab class to kind of give you some exercises to keep your your spatial analysis skills uh, up to date. So it hasn't been like you know a whole term or two since you've dealt with any of the, the spatial data and and so forth and um and then other courses you'll see here there's courses in biostatistics and epidemiology to kind of fulfill that uh the master's program and then like i said before the the courses that are asterisks are the um are for just the certificate program And I should say that the certificate and the master's, those students are in the same classes, but some of them are just going on to take uh, the other, the EPI classes and, and the Biostat classes. And what I also forgot to mention, can we go back to the previ previous slide? I'm sorry. So at the end of year two, you see down at the bottom, an integrative activity course. This is sort of like a project-based course because one of the distinguishing features, there's two distinguishing features of our program. One is we provide 
um, instruction in this field called spatial statistics. So it's all about going beyond the map. Once you're once you've managed the data and got it in GIS and mapped it, now how do we actually analyze that map and interpret those layers? We do that with the field of spatial statistics, and and I'm not familiar with um, other programs out there that would include a component of spatial statistics. The other distinguishing feature of our program is this idea of integrative activity. So everybody in the master's program, not in a certificate, just in the master's program, they they do an integrative activity, which is like a capstone project, okay? And, and one of the features we like to do is we like to allow students to bring in their own data and their own problems and, and use the skills that they learn through the two years to kind of build this independent spatial analysis of their of whatever it is that that they're interested in. So that's an option for students to not only bring in their own data and work on their own problem, but maybe to even develop their own problem as they're going through the uh, through the curriculum to to work on. And uh, and although that is has we have a separate course for that in in the the last term of the last year, your second year, we actually introduced this in year one. So students are working on this. You know, you know, starting in year one, and then they can utilize breaks over the summer and the winter breaks to continue to research their own project and and so forth. And that's just an option to allow students to bring in their own their own project. Um, for students that don't have their own project, we have a series or a pool of available projects that students can pick from. That kind of here's the data, here's the objectives. Now we want you to go and apply everything that you've learned in the two years to develop this independent spatial analysis and everybody writes a a report sort of like in manuscript form that that you could even submit for publication at the end of the program so in terms of online learning at the school of public health you know the school has you know 20 plus years experience in in online learning um, courses are developed with high production value and you'll see this in a lot of the, the lectures that have been pre-recorded there's a whole um, studio down in the basement of our school here that we go in and we record our lectures and then they are I'll say professionally developed after we record them so they take a lot of the uh, us and out us and, and those kind of things and uh, it, it's really high quality production um, and you know the online course activities to keep students engaged throughout the program so you know so not only are you listening to our pre-recorded lectures you know, for every course has about what we call four live talks throughout the term. So almost like one every two weeks where we will get on just like just like I am now and, and talk to the students live and uh, and answer questions back and forth. And we talk about different topics about where we are in the course at that particular time. Sometimes we have guest speakers to talk about a, a paper that we're going to discuss and so forth. So there's a lot of this activity to keep students engaged in addition to here's our pre-recorded lectures, listen to them and and move on through the problem sets and, and other things. And um, so um, there's that. And then there's also um, TA, teaching assistant office hours too, that help students through through coursework and stuff. And, and Hopkins has this great web-based system called Course Plus, which has all the material on there. Um, that that um, that we've recorded and problem sets and so it's it's all there as well as a 24/7 help desk to, to deal with any uh, problems with with that system. But here we are again. Okay, so that's uh, me in the upper left-hand corner. You know, but you know, Liz, John, Derek, Tim, who's sitting right next to me, Aruna. These are all different instructors for the um, different components. Okay, so. Um, Tim and I, we focus on the um, on the on the spatial analysis classes. You know, Liz and Derek, they're the epidemiologists. John McGreedy, he does a lot of the biostatistics, and Aruna does a lot of the professional development um, type classes. So um, together, you can see the multidisciplinary approach right here on this screen. You know, you have biostatistics with me, Tim with geography, Liz and Derek, epi people, John, um, as well as biostatistics. So um, it's a diverse group to give you that that diverse interdisciplinary approach. 
Well, thank you, Frank, for all the insight um, on the special analysis program. Um, for those of you who have joined us after the start of the presentation, please feel free to type in your questions um, into the chat box for a Q&A at the end. I am now going to take some time to go over the admissions requirements. So if you're interested in moving forward, it is important to know what you need to know about the admissions process. All of our applications are processed online through SOFIS and SOFIS Express to streamline your application process. So SOFIS is for the master's degree application, um, SOFIS Express for the certificate application. The requirements for education is a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited college or university. What we're looking for is a sufficient prior quantitative coursework or professional experience as an alternative evidence for the quantitative ability. You will need three letters of recommendation if you are applying to the master's program and one letter of recommendation for the certificate. A current resume or CV, the statement of purpose is, the, um, is part of both applications. So it is a big part of the application process. This is where you will be able to communicate to the admissions committee why this program, how this program matches up with your career and educational objectives that you're trying to fulfill, and how you hope to apply this to your career and in your future. For our international students, if English is not your first um, language, you may need an English proficiency exam. We accept either the TOEFL or the IELTS, the I-E-L-T-S. For those who have obtained education outside of the U.S. for your academic records, um, it is a requirement that you undergo a course-by-course -course credential evaluation via the World Education Services. On this slide, we've shortened it out for WEST. Um, which stands for World Education Services. I do encourage you to review the West required documents. That way you can see what they require from your university and how your university should send those records um, directly. Uh, we are very used to working with our students at, in the Office of Admissions uh, with this. So if you need the, these documents um, or have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us first so we can get you connected to the right resources and websites um, to get you started on that process. Looking over the admissions information, our applications are reviewed on a rolling basis. Um, so it's currently open for the fall of 2020 to start on August 31st, 2020. We are meaning that ongoing rolling basis, meaning that you don't have to wait until a deadline's posted on the slide to hear back from the committee with your decision. We do encourage students to apply early um, so you can receive your decision early. Applications are now open for um, the priority deadline for April 15th, 2020 with a final deadline of June 1st, 2020 for our master's program. And for our certificate program, the deadline is July 1st, 2020. We are here to assist you through the application. So if you have any questions or concerns on the application, uh, you have a support system with us. We only enroll one time per year. So it is important to know if you're excited about this program, we only have one start each year and our applications are now open till August 31st, 2020. Well, to start August 31st, 2020. So if you're interested in starting but don't want to commit to a full course load, you do have flexibility with starting one class at a time. To provide insight on investment of school, right here is listed all our financial aid um, information uh, for those of you who are eligible and to utilize other financial resources such as FAFSA or private loan information. Feel free to look at our website, email, or call the, them on the information listed here. For the 2019-2020 school year, the tuition is $1,162 per credit. We do offer an OPAL scholarship that is available for all these programs, which is a partial scholarship that covers $446 per credit, which leaves the students responsible remain, was for the remaining $716 per credit. This scholarship is specific funding to our OPAL programs, which is our online programs of applied learning. If you are admitted into the program, you are automatically awarded the OPAL scholarship. There is nothing additional you will need to do to receive it. So if you're planning financially, we will want you to plan for the $700, $716 per credit at the current tuition rate. Of course, keeping in mind our tuition rate and scholarships are reassessed each spring. Any changes will be updated on our website in late spring. Just to go over the credit breakdown for the master's, it is 50 and a half credits and the certificate is 18 credits at $716 per credit. Now we have some time for our Q&A session. We do have a few questions coming in already. 
but feel free to type your questions into the chat box if you have not already. Um, so one question, how many students are there in a cohort? Frank, Jim. Yeah, sure. Um, I think in our first cohort, we had 50. Our second cohort, our second and th um, third cohort had um, in the th high 30s. I'm, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the numbers. I think they were around 36. Um, our fourth cohort now, I think we're at 18. Perfect. Thank you. Um, how many students do you accept in the program? Well, I think the ones that, so the numbers I just said, 50, about 36 for years two and three, and then about 18 for this last year. Um, how many we accept? Um, I think, uh, I'm trying, I think there's only, you know, like maybe a, a small handful, maybe two or three that, that don't, that once accepted, um, don't actually don't actually come decide not to come so um, I think the 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 once accepted the matriculation rate is is pretty high in terms of the acceptance rate like people apply and, and whether or not they get in or not I think that's high as well um, I would say close to the 80 to 90 percent in terms of yeah maybe maybe 75 to 85 percent in terms of acceptance rates um, just because a lot of people that are applying um, um, have have background and and so forth, so a lot of them fit well in into the program. Um, one point I I, I will um, reiterate and stress on is is when you're filling out the application, that statement of purpose is is really important. Uh, Tim and I sit on on the admissions committee, and um, and if there's ever a question we have, or if there's a borderline decision and stuff, we always turn to the statement of purpose to see, to get an understanding of why is a student applying for spatial analysis, what do they want to use it for, and, uh, and and information on that. So I would definitely spend time on that statement of purpose in, in your application. Perfect. Just to clarify, so is, there's no cap as to how many students you accept, correct? No, no, not at all. I don't, I don't even cap my classes on site. You know, and I know a lot of professors here at school do cap their classes on site. I mean, we've had GIS classes here that run about 100 and 130, 140 students. And that's a lot because the school itself doesn't have that many students. You know, it's a graduate school in, in, in public health, you know, and even in the spatial statistics classes we teach here on site, you know, the enrollment can get up into the 80s and 90s. Perfect. Thank you. So next question, um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the integrative activity? Um, just a little bit of more of an overview. Sure. Um, so this is a program. So a lot of students come in with, they're, they're either at a job already that, and, and they're kind of learning spatial analysis. So they may be looking, you know, they may be part of a health department and they want to analyze Lyme disease, but, you know, they don't have any of the spatial skills. So, you know, in year one, we introduce what that integrative activity is, okay? And that integrative activity is basically you writing about a 30-page double-spaced report on an independent spatial analysis. You know, where did you get the data? What does the data mean? How did you bring that data into GIS? How did you, you know, map the data to show us, you know, what the data looks like spatially and then analyze it and you'll have some objectives. So, you know, people write this report in terms of well, like a manuscript. So it'll have an introduction where it provides some background about the public health problem and it'll end sort of with objectives or aims that you want to follow through with. And then it'll have the methods. Well, what methods are we going to apply? And those methods will include components of spatial data, where you got the references, where you got it from, GIS, the whole process of bringing that data into GIS, integrating it with other data sources and maybe, maybe making these overlaid maps that we see a lot in, in the literature. And then how did you statistically analyze that data? So what methods did you, of a spatial statistics, did you apply to that data? And then we'll have, then, then you'll write up the results and actually discuss the results in terms of a, a conclusion or, or discussion section. So that's, that's the final end product, okay? But year one, you know, we start right away with, with telling people this and, and providing, you know, documents about um, about the integrative activity. We have a, a separate 
website component that that lists all the integrative activity information and and actually as you go through some of the classes especially in the in the two labs lab one in year one and lab two in year two you are actually doing different pieces of your integrative activity one one assignment might be a lit review so you know go ahead and get 10 articles on your problem of interest and and summarize those articles and uh, and again this could be based on a problem that you bring in or decide during the program that you want to do so it's an it's a a separate problem of your own that you come up with but we're not forced for students to do that that i know a lot of students enjoy that and like that option but um but we also have a pool of of different problems out there that students can pick from to kind of grab hold of and and take in sort of their own direction if they want Perfect, thank you. We do have another question. Um, does the certificate program require the World Education Services course by course evaluation? Um, I could answer this one. So as far as that goes, yes, we do require that um, course by course evaluation, but we're happy to walk you through each step of the way. Um, so if you need resources um, or just a little bit more understanding as to what that looks like, please feel free to call our office. Um, or, and my contact information is on here as well, so you can definitely reach out to us and we can help you. Um, another question would be for Frank and Tim, um, understanding the softwares and applications that you use within mapping, um, would, what are kind of the specific mapping technology used in the program? Can we dig in a little deeper into that? Sure, I'll, I'll field that. Um, so in our first course, the GIS course, we use uh, ArcGIS Pro from ESRI. Uh, that is the you know the the gold standard in the industry. It's what is uh, you know the most widely used, widely accepted uh, across all the industries. So we use that. Um, that is available with the university site license. So every student who's enrolled um, will have access to that software. Um, so that's what we use. We kind of touch on other uh, GISs like QGIS just. Uh, to kind of show that all the concepts we're learning are applicable to any GIS. So, you know, we'll learn it in ArcGIS Pro, but it's uh, you can switch to a different GIS down the line uh, and all the concepts will hold and you'll be able to navigate that fine. Um, the other one I, I probably will mention, and I might, might punt this back to Frank, uh, is, is R with the spatial statistics. So I'll, let me mute my mic and let Frank uh, pick up on that topic. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So, so you'll you'll use the ArcGIS primarily to do the GIS and the mapping, and then we will switch to this um, software called R. And and R is a uh, um, freely available. Okay, so you don't need a site license for it, and it is sort of this most um, uh, scientifically acceptable. Um, software package to do all types of statistical analysis, not just spatial statistics, but it has a it has um, tremendous functionality to do um, spatial statistical analysis so that is what we will use you know so you got the arc pro stuff to do the gis mapping and then we switch over to r to do the um the spatial statistical analysis you'll also see r in the biostatistics classes as part of the two-year mas program so um you'll get some experience in that and just since we're on this idea about software and you know, talking about ARC Pro and, and R and, and this kind of stuff is that, you know, there's no prior knowledge in these softwares. Um, th th these are not a prerequisite to, to know some about this already. Some students come into the program having a little, be, a little bit of GIS, maybe sometimes a lot of GIS, but they're interested more in the spatial statistics or have no GIS at all. And, and that's fine. We provide everybody the same instruction assuming that you have no knowledge in these softwares or these content areas to start with. Perfect, thank you. Um, as far as what is expected of certificate applicants with either biostats or epidemiology, what is it that is expected? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And, and we get this a lot of times in the applications that students are not sure if they have enough of that background. And um, I thought it was available in, in SAP a little bit about this, but in terms of statistics, we would want to have people familiar with statistical analysis um, involving linear regression, 
logistic regression and Poisson regression. And that's just regression for different types of data, whether I have continuous data, binary zero one data or count data. So those are the, the three primary um, types of statistical tools that we look for. And in terms of epidemiology, we want people with at least one solid formal coursework in, in epidemiology to, to transfer, to, to be in the certificate program rather than the, uh, the two-year MAS. So a lot of Perfect. master's programs in in public health, whether it's uh, an MPH, a master's in public health, or a more specialized one like in environmental health or um, or international health, would have already had these EPI and Biostat classes embedded in in their curriculum. Perfect. Um, can we talk a little bit more about the live talks? Um, if someone cannot attend and say they're an international student. What does that look like? Are there specific times that the live talks are given? I know this may vary by professor, but could we yeah, and on at, that? at least in our in our classes that we try to do. Um, and again, no matter what time zone we pick, it, it it's not going to fit everybody. So we try to um, have the live talks early evening um, between like. Uh, 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the U.S. time zone. Um, that just works well for us. Um, and the live talks, like I said, you know, they're live like we're doing right now, okay, where where students can can type in questions and Tim and I, and, and a lot of times it's it's not just Tim or I, it's, it's Tim and I, and we also have the TAs there as well. You know, so it, it's more than just one person on, on the live talk. And, um, and we can go back and forth like this. Sometimes the live talks are, um, have a certain purpose, like, hey, we're going to discuss this article. Everybody's read it. Let, let, let's have a, a group discussion about it and, and things like that. Or other times there's free form. We always like to have part of a live talk, at least part of a live talk to be free form, to ask any questions about the program, um, whether from week one up to whatever week we might be at there. And like I said, the four credit classes usually have about four live talks. You know, and these terms are eight weeks, so that's like one live talk every two weeks. Everything is recorded, okay? And not not just recorded, but it's also transcribed. So any questions that the students ask, and then then you can hear our answers. That's all. That's all transcribed. So um, a lot of people, you know, um, that don't attend or can't attend the live talks, um, go right to the recorded sessions, and they can see pretty much everything as though they were live. Perfect. Thank you. Um, for the time commitment, what, what would you say the time commitment looks like for the certificate um, and the master's? Well, the master's and the certificate students are taking the same classes. Okay, so it, it's not different. One is one is a year long, and the other is two years long. So, um, and and the certificate students are taking it all in one year. So, um, so in their first two courses. You know, for the certificate students, they are in with a year one cohort students, okay? And then when they switch to the um, term three and term four of their first year, they are now in with second year master's students, okay? So they're, they're getting the same courses. So so in terms of that course load and, and how much time for each course is devoted, it, it's the same as for MAS versus versus the certificate. The MAS uh, students are also taking another two credit class. Um, and, and I'm going to dodge a little bit the question on well, how many hours does it actually take per course because that really varies based on the student. Um, but you know, I would think for a four credit class, I, I think it was um, maybe like one to two hours per week per credit. So maybe for a four credit class, you're you're thinking about six to eight hours a week, you know. And I'm looking over at Tim as I'm saying this, um, uh, just just to get an idea. But that that can vary a lot, and um, and that's not meant to to intimidate anybody or meant to um, encourage people. Um, that that's just kind of given our best assessment of it. It's not something that we routinely ask the students or get surveyed. Although now that I think about it, that might be a good question that we ask students after after the courses on, on these routine course evaluations to come out. But a point I want to make about that is that the resources are available here if you're struggling or, or if you have questions. I mean, 
Um, you'll hear us live every other week. You have the course lectures. You have all our resources in terms of, of recorded lectures and notes and that kind of stuff. But then you also have the TAs, and the TAs have – I think on the order of, I mean, for a four credit class of our, our, in terms of our spatial analysis classes, I mean, there'll be TA office hours two to three hours a week, you know, and uh, and then these are on the weekends and are at night to kind of help with uh, different time zones and, and so forth. Yeah, we also have an, you know, so that course plus online system that I mentioned that, that Hopkins has for each course. So each course will have its own website and and all the material the lectures all that stuff is is on the website but there's also a discussion forum where if you have a question and you don't want to wait till office hours you can post that question on the discussion forum and other students chime in and and we encourage other students to kind of do this not peer assessment but peer support you know hey i have a question about problem two on on the problem set did anybody have a similar question somebody might say yeah and I asked the TA and this is the answer I got stuff like that is ideal and also the TAs monitor the discussion forum so if they're seeing that a question is not being answered or can't be answered well they will chime in and answer the questions and sometimes they they contact me and say hey can you go look at the discussion forum this question I think could could use your feedback or insight and then we obviously do that as well so um, there's a lot of support there for for students perfect thank you the next question would be networking opportunities what are what does that look like in being in the program so students kind of take on this themselves you know, so there is that discussion form and and sometimes that discussion form takes you know a life of it you know takes on a life of its own you know the the original post from a student may start out with hey i had like i said i have i have a question on problem two of this and did anybody have a similar question and then you know 15 posts down below it got completely off of that um i know students in the past have um opened up a facebook for their cohort and and have invited the rest of the class on and um I don't think Tim or I ever got the inv invitation to to share in that Facebook, but um, but yeah, they, there there's a lot of that networking going on, and and we really in, encourage that. So when we first heard about that Facebook, I you know I thought it was a great idea for students to do that, and and this is something that we could also mention in like our first live talk is to encourage students to do this networking and get to know each other, and and like I said, it, it that really feeds into one of the unique aspects of our program that it's not just here's a textbook you know let's do chapter one and the questions at the end it, it's so much of this group and and interactive stuff um as well i think tim is going to add a, add a comment here i was just going to piggyback on uh, frank's comments there so the discussion forum the students do work together you know through course issues um and we do see it extend beyond that but um we also have created a, uh, a LinkedIn site, so for spatial analysis. So I know students stay connected, you know, at very least through that, you know, once they leave the program. Uh, so that's pretty interesting to watch that. And we watch the uh, the new positions they they get hired into, and they they keep communicating. And I'm sure the uh, the Facebook groups and whatever else they uh, they have organized extend well beyond uh, the program as well. Great, thanks, Tim. And just one other point I want to make in terms of this networking is 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 I want to make sure I emphasize that you know the Hopkins online student population is no different than the on-site student population. Sometimes we have students that are are relatively close, and and several students in the past have come and visited us here at Hopkins and and come for different seminars and and that kind of stuff. And and we certainly welcome that and encourage that obviously that can't apply to everybody that that is you know hours away or days away from from baltimore maryland but i also want to make sure i mention in in this presentation is that you know at the end of the year at the end of your program whether you're graduating with a um a certificate or a uh, or mas you know you're invited to graduation and we have a um we have a um yeah, we have a you know convocation here, and, and students come and, and get their diploma, and um, we also have a a kind of kind of mini get together for students that that from the Opal classes specifically. And when we first did this spatial analysis program four years ago, 
um, like I said, we had 50 students enrolled and I think like 26 or 27 actually came here for graduation. And that was so nice to actually meet students in person um, and so forth. And then even in the years past that we always have a large percentage of our cohort come to Hopkins um, during that, that graduation day or two. And we, like I said, the night before we usually have a, a get together type celebration for all the OPAL programs now, which we have, I think about six or seven different programs. Thank you, Frank and Tim, that was really insightful. For those of you, um, if you have any last minute questions, please feel free to send them in. We only have a couple more minutes left. Um, we do have another question. Um, is there another extra cost um, other than tuition fee? Is there um, other costs associated with it? So the application fee for the master's would be $135. So besides the tuition fee, um, it would be the, if you get admitted into the program, you would just need to pay your enrollment fee. And we can discuss that a little bit further as to what that looks like once we cross that bridge. But um, that is a great question. As far as um, another question I do have for you, Frank and Tim, what is the expectation of what you're looking for? What is the admissions committee looking for from um, in, in a student's undergrad background? Again, this this varies a lot because sometimes we have applicants that have, you know, graduated undergraduate in in the 80s and the 90s, and uh, um, and that's fine, and 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 they want to come back to school, and um, obviously if they, you know, didn't do as well as they would have liked to back in the 80s and 90s, we we can understand that that a lot of time has since passed since then and we kind of look at well what is your job now and and what are you doing um so yeah we're we're looking for coursework we're looking for coursework in the in the biological sciences and the quantitative sciences so math statistics um we're looking for computer skills um you know not not necessarily gis or spatial statistical skills but but the fact that you know using a computer you know Word, Excel, these kind of applications, and and you've done some statistical analysis, whether formal, whether it's in formal coursework or on the job coursework. So you may not have had a statistics class, or you had one back in 1990 when you're doing your undergrad, but you've been doing a lot of quantitative analysis and quantitative work as part of your your current job. Um, so I mean, so we're we're you know every student is kind of evaluated independently because we get such a variety of, of students um, but like I said before I will emphasize an important piece being that that personal statement about why are you choosing spatial analysis where do you see it being used in your career beyond the program and 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 thing and what brings you to spatial analysis those are the things that we're we're interested in in hearing and seeing Perfect, thank you. Um, so we do have a couple of minutes left. So why would someone choose this program versus the other spa other spatial analysis programs that may be out there? What I alluded to earlier is that um, we have this comprehensive spatial paradigm that we follow. Okay, so it starts with spatial data, has GIS, and it and it ends with spatial statistics. And and there are not a lot of institutions that have the expertise and formal curricula in the area of spatial statistics, and and that's what we can offer here. There are there are other GIS programs out there, and they may be called GIS programs because that's what it is. They're they're just getting you to the point of of GIS, and and maybe they come out of you know more specialized um, departments like you know environmental health or um, or um, uh, or like state planning institutions and, and, and urban development and these kind of stuff. You know, we're coming out of this general public health um, paradigm. And so that that's a a big selling point for our program is, is, is this idea of spatial statistics. Now, some may include it and some may teach it right off of the software Arc Pro and, and, and people that are familiar with the ArcGIS software, they do have components in there that do spatial statistical analysis, but a lot of it is based on drop-down menu 
you know, picking and choosing without really understanding the, the details enough to be able to, I think, apply it well on your own with, uh, with moving forward past the, past the program. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the, it's a completely 100% online program too, which, which is a great selling point. So you get to stay in place, you get to continue your work and your job. And, and we're very flexible. We, we understand people have lives, you know, whether it's small kids, full-time jobs, all these kind of things. Um, comes into play with uh, with our program and, and so we like to be known as being very flexible to those to those situations but um, in terms I, I think I think we stand out out not just because we're Hopkins but because our program has this specialized um, comprehensive paradigm that that we follow Perfect. Well, thank you all um, for your attendance. Uh, that, that's it with the questions, considering we're coming down to the time. If we didn't get to your questions, we will be connecting with you offline. Our, our missions team um, here will contact you directly in the next few days to assist in answering your questions. If you want to connect um, with someone immediately, my contact information is here on the slide. Feel free to reach out via email or directly call me. Um, it works. If you're excited about this per presentation and you see this as part of your future, please use the scan codes here to move forward with your application. Um, we have a dedicated admissions team looking forward to working with each and every one of you throughout the application process. Um, any parting comments from um, Frank and Tim? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I appreciate everybody's attendance and, and I hope some of this stuff was helpful. There were great questions. Um, if you have other questions, like, like Amira is saying, please feel free to reach out. And if you'd like to talk to myself or Tim, which we have done in the past with plenty of prospective students, um, I'm, we're certainly open to that. And just let and just let Amira know that, you know, I'd like to talk to Frank or Tim specifically about this stuff. And it usually starts with an email and then I can connect with, with those pr prospective students um, by phone or however is best, Skype or, or whatever. Tim, do you have any parting comments? I'll keep it brief. Uh, pleasure sharing our program with you. Uh, and like Frank said, we're happy to answer more questions or specific questions you may have. Um, and good, good luck with the process here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Frank and Tim. Um, thank you all for joining us. We hope to speak to you soon and have a great rest of your day.